We're here in LA at Evasive Motorsport and one of my favourite cars at the moment is the Toyota 86. In the US market it's the Scion FRS or Subaru BRZ and Evasive Motorsport here in LA were one of the first uh, tuning shops uh, anywhere to really embrace that platform and develop it and uh, the Evasive Motorsport car behind us uh, has been kind of a, a giant killer in both uh, global time attack as well as at Pikes Peak. So we thought we'd take the opportunity opportunity to chat with Mike about the development process for this car. So Mike, first of all, you, as I've mentioned, were one of the first in the US or probably anywhere in the world to really embrace that FRS platform. Now, when you've got a model that currently has limited aftermarket support, what was your sort of uh, strategy for developing the platform and, and turning it into a competitive time attack car? Well, the strategy for us has always been um developed the car as far as overall balance. So we did most of the work in-house as far as fabricating the aerodynamics, as far as, uh, you know, most of the roll cage, everything is done in-house. A lot of it, you know, when the car first came out, um, there was no aftermarket support. So we, were, we basically had to make everything ourselves. So um, it, is a, it is a kind of a process that takes time too. So, you know, two years after we've probably gone through, you know, many changes and stuff like that and you know overall it's the car has been well developed you know throughout the years and when you're talking about balance this still even in its current generation is it's probably not one of the most powerful cars out there competing we'll talk about that that engine in a little bit more detail now most people we've seen around the world, or I won't say most people, a lot of people developing this platform have gone with uh, some known technology, maybe an EJ25 swap or uh, the Toyota 2JZ is another popular one. Uh, what made you decide to stick to the FA20 when there really was no development on that engine at the time? Well, I mean, for us here at Evasive, our business model has always been to connect with our customers. And I feel like, you know, um, by by keeping the original engine and developing it and showing what, you know, showing what the average consumer can actually achieve with their factory equipped engine is something that's really important to us. And, you know, we could have gone the easy way out and swapped in, you know, a powerful engine or something like that. But, you know, average guy is never going to do that. But, you know, a guy who sees our car could be like, hey, you know, I could supercharge my car and get, you know, almost the same results. And that's something we really want to, you know, keep in touch with our customer as far as letting them know that, you know, what it comes stock has potential, but it just takes some, you know, work and patience with it. In terms of the modifications you've made to the, the engine, I've followed the build on the FT86 forums over the, the time you've been developing the car. You're running the HKS supercharger kit. Uh, can you give us some insight into why you went with the supercharger? I mean, generally it's probably accepted turbochargers are a better option for um, high-end power. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, HKS has been with us since day one with this car uh, as far as development goes. And... Uh, I feel like supercharging has emerged as one of the, uh, you know, one of the preferred options these days as for, you know, goes back to what the general consumers are going to be uh, going after uh, as far as reliability, um, just everyday usable power, um, low maintenance. Um, that's what a supercharger can really provide. Um, one of the main thing is that the supercharger does not provide a um, massive amount of power you would get from a turbocharger. But... But we feel like, you know, that's something that, you know, for an everyday user of a car, you know, they're probably looking for more of a usable, usable power, the, the linear response and, you know, the, the mid-range torque and stuff like that. So. And when you're talking about that linear power as well, this is a centrifugal uh, supercharger, which you could kind of liken to almost a belt-driven uh, su belt driven turbocharger. Yep. Now, the, the advantage with that is your, your boost curve is quite linear with uh, relationship to to RPM, so basically the further you rev the engine, mm -hmm. uh, the more boost you get. So you're not gonna get that real big rush of uh, torque down low, that'd be fair? No, definitely not. I mean, the, the car, how I describe it is, it feels like a really powerful NA engine. And, you know, some people prefer it, some people prefer that, you know, that rush that the turbocharger gives you. But, you know, to, uh, you know, for, for us, we, we actually, you know, we do a lot of, HPDE track events on weekends, and a lot of times, you know, uh, when you're doing a technical course, you know, coming out of corners and stuff like that, you kind of want that NA, 
you know, zero lag feel. It's just kind of power out through the corners and let the car's momentum take you, you know, through the track. So that's something we, we kind of like ourselves. So, In terms of the kit, is this still uh, very much a, a production-based kit that uh, anyone could buy from HKS or from Evasive at the moment? Um, they, it's actually, it's, ours has been modified. Um, we actually use uh, larger um, piping and um, larger intercooler because we're actually running race gas and we're you know we're actually pushing the the kit to the extreme. Um, but you know the the charger itself, everything is same as an off the shelf unit. So if anybody wants to actually get the kit, they can actually get it. But if you want to make uh, you know right now we make about 430 horsepower to get it to that point, you do have to modify the kit. But you know all not all the components are pretty much off the shelf. Now that 430 horsepower, can you tell us what boost you're using to, to make that? Uh, it's boosting about 24 PSI, yeah. Now in terms of engine reliability, what you've done to the engine to support that, uh, what, what's in there? Uh, the engine is running a HKS stroker kit, it's a 2.1 litre stroker kit, um, you know, HKS original uh, crank, uh, rods, pistons, uh, head gasket, and it also has their HKS uh, camshafts. So everything's been reinforced, and one of the weakest component on the FA20 is the connecting rod. So, you know, with that beefed up, the engine could take quite about uh, quite a bit of boost. So, with that Stroker Kit 2.1, you're you're only talking about 100 cc's of capacity gain. What sort of improvements in mid-range torque and performance did you see from from going to that Stroker Kit? Um, it definitely improved the overall feel and and, and response of the engine. Um, I think. It's it's a very minor difference as far as displacement goes, but you know you are using lighter, lighter com uh, engine components too. So all, everything all in all, it does help with the response of the engine. Okay, let's talk about the rest of the the package in the car. So again, you've you, the gearbox in these cars is probably not designed around 430 horsepower. So uh, what have you done there to keep that reliable? Uh, we're using a Hewlin uh, five-speed dog box. Um, Originally, the, the unit is designed for Corvettes, so we know it can take you know, whatever power we can throw at it. So we um, got a custom bell housing made, um, made it up the, uh, with the Hewlin and then a dry shaft shop, a carbon dry shaft. Um, so far, it hasn't given us any issues, and we like the fact that we can change gear ratio on the fly you know, to accommodate whatever track we go to. Rear differential, is that still the factory unit? Still factory unit, we just have a larger um, cover to, you know, uh, and then we also have um, diff cooler and we also have a one and a half way um, Cusco LSD. Now, obviously the aero package on the car, we, we've already mentioned it briefly, is, is quite uh, dramatic and that's in terms of getting that, that balance between the power and the downforce and this is really what's letting you uh, foot it with cars that produce a lot more power both in mm -hmm. global time attack and sure. at Pike's Peak. Mm -hmm. So with the, with the results you've got so far, can you tell us how you've performed at global time attack and Pike's Peak? Well, um, uh, at Pikes Peak, you know, first time we went was two years ago, and we actually, you know, surprisingly, we, we went under one, uh, 11 minutes, and that's not bad for a car that's never been really taken up on the mountain, or it's the first time pretty much out. Um, from there, we developed the aero, more, and chassis, um, everything except for the power. We actually returned the next year with the same amount of power, yet um, we shaved off about 22 seconds from our previous time. So that goes to show you that, you know, changes besides power actually do make a difference. Um, and as far as Global Time Attack goes, um, this previous Super Lab battle, Global Time Attack, we placed second in our class, which is limited real-wheel drive. Um, we set the fastest time ever recorded at Button Willow by FRS. Um, the, at the time was a 147. And uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, you know, there's, there are Evos, there are, there are cars out there that are running five, 600 horsepower, running roughly about the same time. So. Um, well, I, what I like to say is basically, you know, the time comes from the, the, the balance of the car, the, the chassis, the handling, and the aerodynamics. Uh, we were able to go in corners and not break as much as other people. We were able to carry the speed and just momentum throughout the track. So our average speed is much higher than a car that, you know, even though they have 200 more horsepower, they will have to slow down a lot more, they, you know, on cornering and such. So. Um, I think overall the car does did really well for for a car that's under power. We we do see that all the time as well, where people get uh, so caught up in that race for power, mm -hmm. and uh, they've got an ill handling car, 
and instead of fixing the, the handling problems or getting that balance which you've focused obviously so much on uh, they go and throw another two or three hundred horsepower at it and unsurprisingly that car that didn't handle too well with less power yeah. just gets a whole bunch worse when you yeah. when you increase it yeah. now what what have you actually done to validate your uh, aero package and you've said you've gone through iterations you said you made some changes mm -hmm. between uh, Pikes Peak last year and this year so how do you validate that I mean I don't see a wind tunnel here no. I'm guessing you're not going and doing some yeah. F1 testing what 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 do you do um, a lot of it is you know um, a lot of it is based on you know a good driver we have a really good driver that provided us with a lot of valuable feedback and I think these days it's hard to find somebody who can tell you hey I think the car needs a little bit more front down for us or the rear seems a little bit loose um, based on that we were able to make minor changes to the to the vehicle and obviously you know arrows arrows mostly a theory so a lot of times we are trying stuff out that's never been done before and um, the best benchmark is lap time and you know we we have we have uh, data loggers in the car that are running constantly when the car's on track so we will tell you know entry speed cornering speed and you know from that you can get a pretty good idea of what's working and what's not and then um, you know every change you make you know believe it or not it makes a big difference on track so um, you know, throughout the years, we ha gather enough data to actually make the correct changes. And I think right now we have a pretty good aerial package that will allow more power if we add to it, you know, so. Look, uh, thanks for talking to us about the car today, Mike. As, as I said, it's a car that I've followed uh, since you started developing it. And I think for all of those FRS guys out there around the world, it's kind of a, some inspiration, a, a giant killer, if you will. And it uh, just goes to show uh, what can be achieved with a focus on balance and uh, you know, not necessarily outright power. Now, the car's headed uh, at the end of this week over to Japan. So we uh, wish you all the best over there. And again, thanks for chatting to us. Yeah, thank you very much.